Mark Edmondson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Well, uh, I love your work. Your first book, I, as I said before we got on, was that I read was uh, Why Football Matters. As a football player, I loved it. Uh, gave me some new, new insights and nuance to the, to the sport that I played as a boy. But your latest book is something that I, I one of my favorite books I read in 2015. It's called Self oh. and the Soul. And uh, you make uh, this really bold claim uh, in the, from the very get-go that here in the West, particularly Western democracies, the world of the soul, or what you call, you know, what's the world of ideals, is declining. And we've become a culture of the self. Let's talk about ideals first, because I think there's a lot of people who would be listening to this would say, well, hey, Mr. Mr. Professor, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have ideals. I, I love my family. I love freedom. I love Jesus. I'm a social justice warrior. I'm, I'm out there protecting the environment. Mm-hmm. Aren't, aren't those ideals? Um, I take it that there are three main ideals in the Western tradition and that they come to us um, from the ancient world, and that the first one is uh, courage, and that's exemplified in Homer by Achilles and Hector, and uh, the second one is the quest for wisdom, and that's exemplified by uh, Plato and Socrates in a combination, and uh, that the um, the third one is compassion, and that's exemplified for us in the West by Jesus of Nazareth, but there are predecessors to that particular uh, uh, ideal, and those are to be found in the, the Hindu texts and in the uh, teachings of the Buddha, and in some measure in the teachings of, uh, of Confucius. So my, my, my study of uh, ancient uh, writings and thought uh, leads me to think that those are the three uh, uh, central ideals. Gotcha. So let's, let's delve into those a little bit deeper. So sure. courage. I mean, aren't there soldiers out there today who are you know, in combat, who are being courageous? Um, what is it that you have in mind uh, as the ideal of courage taken from Homer? Sure. Um, so in Homer, I find two ideals of courage. One of them is um, probably more available to us and more congenial to us, uh, and that's the ideal of, uh, of Hector. Um, and Hector is the great citizen soldier who defends his city, Troy, against the onslaught of the, uh, of the Greeks. Um, Hector's a very appealing character, as, as you probably know. Um, he's very humane and very decent, um, he's the one of the only two males in uh, in Troy who treats Helen with uh, kindness and decency. And uh, we see him with his wife and with his baby, and we see that he's a loving husband who uh, treats his wife Andromache as an equal and a friend. And he's a wonderful father to his boy Astyanax. So it's a very touching scene uh, uh, between them. Um, but uh, Hector is also a ferocious warrior who fights and eventually dies uh, in the uh, um, in the process of trying to save his. Uh, his city. Um, he says at one point that uh, he was not born to be a warrior, that he had to learn uh, to be a fighter. And uh, he probably would have been better off, uh, and Troy would have been better off if the Greeks never showed up and uh, Hector had taken over the throne from Priam and uh, ruled in a judicious and humane manner. But when war came, um, Hector was willing to step forward and, uh, and fight, for his, uh, fight for his city. Um, and he did so with great valor. However, he lost. Um, the other great idea is, is Achilles. Um, which we can talk about in a minute. But it seems to me that there probably are exemplars of, uh, of Hector um, of fighting uh, for laudable causes uh, in the world right now. Um, and I wouldn't doubt that there are some of those people representing America here and there uh, in the globe who have decided, as Hector does, that overall the cause of Troy, the cause of America is just, and have decided that they're willing to risk, risk their lives and everything they value uh, for them. We don't hear a lot of stories about those people, um, and I wish we did, and there are lots of reasons for that that are very complicated. But I think that the ideal of Hector exists, and I think that a lot of people in the military would still respect it. Um, uh, the question then becomes, uh, how much does the rest of America respect it? How many people who are sending their children to college devoutly hope that those children will go out uh, and be Hector-like fighters uh, for the United States. And, and I'm guessing not too many. Um, some, but not too many. So we, we still respect that ideal, but there's fewer and fewer actually living it, or, you know, I guess living it in some way. I think so. I think that's the case. I think most of the middle class wants their children to be prosperous, successful, and uh, decent, um, and not uh, to risk their lives in uh, uh, the pursuit of, uh, you know, the preservation of the nation. That's, that's for other people's kids uh, to do. 
Um, but I think everybody admires the Hector figure still. It's just a little ident- difficult to identify him or her. It's the Achilles figure who is really problematic. Um, the Achilles figure is the figure who I believe probably still exists, and you can find him, and now her, because the, all the combat roles are open to um, both genders now, recent development. Um, and you can find him in the Navy SEALs and in the Green Berets and sometimes just in the ranks. And this is the person who will do absolutely anything to win the battle, anything within reason and bounds, and according to the rules of law, uh, to win the battle and uh, to bring his or her uh, colleagues home. Um, this soldier fights for glory and doesn't spend a whole lot of time wondering about whether the nation's cause is just. She signed on the dotted line, he signed on the dotted line, and will go where he is sent, will go where she is sent, and do what needs to be done. Um, it's a... Uh, it's a much more difficult ideal um, to take in without some serious doubts, but I take it to be an ideal nonetheless. And although the weight of scholarly opinion now is that Hector is the hero of the Iliad and Hector is the most admirable figure, I'm not so sure that's true. You know, yeah, Achilles is 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 problematic, and uh, he's one of those. Sure. It it seems like even Homer had you know wasn't so sure about him as well, or even like Plato and Socrates. Um, no one is sure about Achilles, right? Right. But thinkers, um, Achilles may go into a rage um, when uh, he fights uh, to revenge Patroclus, and that may well be something that uh, Homer finds abhorrent. He does that amazing scene where a river um, becomes so furious at Achilles for filling it with the bodies of the Trojans that the uh, river. Um, uh, attacks Achilles himself. Now, is that the revulsion of nature against Achilles? It's a very bizarre scene, and not like anything else that occurs in the uh, in the poem. Um, Homer easily could have dropped it, but uh, he doesn't. The river uh, tries to kill um, Achilles. Now, that suggests a strong level of ambivalence. But a simple question, you know, if you were, or I were, we're probably not in a position to be, um, going out um, on, on a combat mission, um, who do you want in front of you? You know? Yeah, I'd I want think you Achilles. probably want Achilles. Yeah. He will win. I mean, when Hector and Achilles fight, everybody roots for Hector, but it's clear who's going to win, and it's pretty clear why. Yeah, and, and I mean, so is is someone like Achilles who like lives for this ideal of I don't know what you would call it. It's very martial and uh, you know visceral courage. Are, are these folks born? Is like they have something in them, like a muse, <laughs> you know? telling them this is, this is what you're destined for and this is what you're going to f- you're do with your life or is it something yeah I guess this it, is one of the, the hardest questions in the book and I uh, this is it's an easy question in a way because I simply don't know how to answer it sure um, where does the urge to this kind of excellence come from um, is it because there's a, there are gods on high who love this kind of behavior that would be Homer's answer I think though how metaphorical the gods are in Homer is an open question I don't know where it comes from, but there will be all over America and all over the world right now boys and girls who sit and thrill to the tales of heroes, and some will simply sit and thrill, and a few others will say, that's what I've got to do, that's me. And where that comes from, nobody knows. Whether it comes from God or comes from the devil, it is their destiny, and some of them will embrace it. And I dare say, though I'm not quite a pacifist, but prone to the the peaceful solution myself, you can't have a civilization without them. Right. You know, people, progressive people, liberal people like to forget about them, but when it gets really dark and bad days come, you look for those people and you desperately need them. Right. As I was reading that, that section on courage and thinking about Achilles and sort of this veneration for violence for you know as a way to get glory and the respect and the esteem of your peers... Um, I was. It made me think about, for some reason, uh, the Islamist terrorists that we're seeing right now. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I've noticed in the West, at least, whenever you you hear people talk about uh, the, the terrorists in, in the, the Islamic world, it's like, well, you know, if we just if they just had jobs, or you know, if we just like gave them money and like they had prosperity, then like they wouldn't do this. And I, as I was read that, well, I, I thought, well, maybe not. Right? Maybe they're not creatures of the self and well i guess we need to talk about the self is but but they they, they're living they're doing something for an ideal right and like we're just sort of like in different wavelengths uh here in our comfortable middle class american world is that what's do you think islamist terrorists are sort of problematic a problematic dimension of the book that is is the isis fighter who blows himself or herself up 
in the middle of a group of civilians um, in Akile and Hero? My answer to that is a pretty unequivocal no. Okay. Achilles fights according to the rules of war in his time. He stands up chiefly against other warriors who see him coming and are prepared to fight against him, and his heroism consists in matching his prowess against the prowess of other fighters. Now, you know, not against women and children and defenseless civilians. So somebody who blows themselves up in the middle of women and children, defenseless civilians, is not a hero and is not courageous from, uh, from this point of view. Um, there's also a misunderstanding that's quite possible on the subject of ideals. Um, and what I would want to suggest here is that just believing in something strongly, like, you know, the destiny of the United States or the necessity for the caliphate or whatever it is, that's not an ideal, right? Okay. Uh, to me, the ideals are, um, uh, you know, courage, contemplation, compassion, and maybe creativity, and they tend to be, with some qualifications applied to compassion, very personal commitments, right? You attempt to reach a standard, um, and uh, it's not about believing in America or believing in the caliphate. It's about believing in a standard that's been generated for thousands of years and a life you want to participate in based on being inspired by that. Okay. All right. That that makes sense. Well, let's, I mean, do you think we've we've covered courage enough? Do you think yeah, we, sure. We got the, the gist of it. Well, let's move on to the, this the idea that the contemplative life. And you use uh, Plato and Socrates as the exemplars of that. Now, again, like people would say, well, no, we, us here in the, 21st century, we think a lot. We got TED Talks, right? We've got uh, think tanks. We have professors who are thinking about lots of deep issues. Um, how is what we, you know, kind of consider the ideal of contemplation different from this ancient ideal of contemplation that exemplified by Socrates and Plato? Well, let's let's start let's start early. Um, Socrates comes along, and fundamentally, his effort is to clean house. Okay. Uh, he goes through Athens and he questions people about their beliefs, and he finds that their beliefs are based on confusion, contradiction, and self-promotion. Okay, and he is continually able to show that you know what these people are uh, involved in is truth is nothing more than shadows on the wall. You see it continually in the dialogue, um, and so that's a demystifying and debunking kind of tendency. All honor to it, but it doesn't complete philosophy. Uh, philosophy aspires to be completed at the point where Plato comes along and he offers what he takes to be truths that are eternal truths, right? That is, Plato isn't just talking about Athens and he's not just talking about Greeks and he's not just talking about the world in his particular time frame. He believes that he has gotten out what the good life is, what good government is, what education is, what the relationship between men and women is, what a philosopher is, all of those things for all time. But you may refute him, you may not like it, you may struggle against him, um, but that is what he thinks he's doing. And other philosophers have come along to give that a try, too. You know, Schopenhauer surely has, and Kant surely has, and Hegel surely has. Um, so, um, you know, that ideal, I think, is pronounced, and it made its way all the way through um, Western culture um, with the kind of uh, toss-off observation that all philosophy is a footnote to Plato, right? Philosophy is no longer a footnote to Plato in that all the people in the think tanks and all the people who are doing exercising punditry on TV uh, and all the people who are writing books about um, you know social justice or whatever it is um, are not trying to find eternal truth. Now, they may have good reason for giving up eternal truth, but I don't want that aspiration to die. I don't want it to be a laughing stock as it currently is in most philosophy departments. So there is an inch I should add a footnote there. There's an interest in philosophy departments in finding what is essentially a good argument, a true argument, a just mode of representation. And there's something of the eternal in that particular pursuit. Oh, but virtually nobody who is you know, sitting at a think tank does much thinking about um, uh, eternal truth. Mostly they think tactically and pragmatically. What do we need to say and know and think in order to get what it is we want and need at the uh, at present? So they are much, much more children of uh, uh, John Dewey and uh, William James and my good friend and former colleague, whom I greatly mourn, uh, Richard Rorty, than they are of uh, Plato and Socrates. Okay, so the, the idea of contemplation is for an eternal truth, not just for short-term pragmatic results. Okay. And, and it seemed too that, <coughs> I mean, you have to be willing to sacrifice yourself, right, for this ideal, right? You, you give up the self, right? You, you sort of, okay, I don't care if I'm dirty, if I'm like, people think I'm a laughingstock, 
Uh, I don't care if even if they want to kill me, like in the case of Socrates, like I'm still going to stick to that ideal. Yes. Um, they, uh, <laughs> they, the, the true ones are like that. Um, I mean, Schopenhauer, whom I take to be the most profound philosopher after Plato, gave his lectures um, in proximity to Hegel. And, you know, Schopenhauer got about seven students and Hegel got about 7,000. And Schopenhauer was ignored virtually his whole life. Um, and he was not in disgrace or disdain in particular, um, but he had no disciples and he had no readers. Um, and uh, so he lived in, not poverty, he had a little bit of money, uh, but he lived in complete neglect. Um, and he was humiliated uh, by it. And uh, he was stoical about it. He said, they will find my work after I'm gone. Um, but then late in his life, uh, he was reviewed a couple of times in England, of all places, long review essays written by young people. And uh, he said in Latin, I don't know the quotation, I am read and I shall be read, and came close to breaking into tears, which for Schopenhauer, he's very tough and a rather nasty person in a lot of ways, um, is, is, was, was quite uh, something. Um, so, you know, every authentic philosopher doesn't end up in poverty, neglect, and uh, on trial for his life. Um, but I think that what Nietzsche, the word that Nietzsche uses about true thinking, his own included, is that it has to be untimely. It's going to be out of joint with the times because the times are always going to gravitate in the direction of a certain kind of intellectual conformity and apologists, apology for that kind of uh, intellectual conformity. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's never going to make its way easily if it's true. Right, right. I thought it was interesting that you noted how, or I think one of the philosophers noted that you quoted in the book, how most major philosophers or great philosophers were, were bachelors. Except for Socrates, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, they didn't have to have worry about kids and a wife. Like they just wanted to think. Yes, yes, that is true. There's a kind of there's an undercurrent of uh, suspicion about family life in the book that I don't think most people will find agreeable. I mean, family is now the American religion. You can justify anything by way of recourse to your family. You know, I've, you know, I, I sold off the company. I fired twenty people. I, you know, thinned it down, and now it's, you know, much more profitable, but a couple of people don't, can't pay their mortgage, but I did it for my family. Oh, you did it for your family. Well, they needed to eat. That's okay. Um, you know, family is, the, is kind of the universal excuse and the universal value. Um, but, you know, there's that moment in the Gospels where, and, and I have a family, and I love my family, and I do for it what I can, but my relationship to familiar life is a little, maybe a little more skeptical than most people. There's that moment in the Gospel where they say to Jesus, your family's outside. Waiting for you. It's odd that to imagine that Jesus has brothers and sisters, right? I mean, just, yeah. he does. Um, and Jesus says, I haven't got any family. You're my family. <laughs> He's got his disciples and his friends. You're my family. I haven't got any family. Yeah. Uh, and uh, most of the heroes of this book are, are non familial uh, uh, people. They're yeah. mostly non familial. And okay. they, don't, they don't affirm uh, uh, family. Um, uh, I, you know, uh, we can talk in the end about, you know, kind of. Um, combinations of self and soul. I take myself to be uh, aspiring to a combination of those things, and they're, they're somewhat difficult and maybe somewhat compromised. Um, but uh, pure soul is skeptical about family and all involvement with self. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well let's, let's, let's talk about Jesus for a second, or let's move on to compassion. Because um, sure. I thought this was, a, you know, as a, a guy who considers himself a Christian, uh, this was a, a, just a really fascinating uh, chapter for me, and also the insights we get from. <coughs> Excuse me. The Buddha was interesting as well. Um, so this ideal of compassion, uh, I think it's interesting. You argue that you know Jesus has, even though like you know compassion and courage, we often sort of think as uh, diametrically opposed. Uh, but Jesus and Achilles had a lot in common. So how can these two virtues, like compassion and courage, have something in common uh, when they seem on the surface opposed? Well, I think that what they have in common is that they reject um, the life of money and home and tranquility and satisfaction and uh, the professions and respectability. Um, but I do think that also they are ideals and idealists who are going to chafe each other, you know? I mean, Jesus really does want the cessation of war and would like to imagine a world in which uh, uh, peace reigned. Achilles would not be at home in that world, and that would be the end of uh, that would be the end of that. And in the book, I attempt to justify this tension among the ideals uh, by saying that you know, to everything there's a season, and you know, when a nation is at war, the way and in a just war, the way America was, I believe in. Uh, 
in World War II, then you need Achilles and you need uh, you need Hector. You need him more than you need Jesus, probably, because the people who are fighting you are absolutely remorseless and absolutely relentless. Um, but, you know, when any time that it's possible, um, you know, recourse to Jesus and the thinkers is by far preferable. <laughs> um, they have things in common. Uh, their relative insubordination, insouciance, and, you know, their, their laws unto themselves, it appears, but they respond to a higher law, the law of kindness and, on the part of Jesus, and the law of courage on the part of Achilles and, uh, and Hector. So they have things in common, but the values they um, uh, endorse are, are in conflict with each other. There's no way around that. Right. So what do you mean by compassion? Like, what do you think the Buddha and Jesus are, we're trying to get at, we're trying to get us to think about and, and live in our own lives in, in terms of being compassionate? Yeah. But this is the toughest of all, uh, really, I think, to put into practice all the time. Um, and, um, you know, and Schopenhauer, actually, who, harsh as he is, um, loves the Buddha and loves the Jesus that he imagines, um, says that, you know, the, most of us walk down the street and we see another person and we say, that's, that's another person. That's he, that's she, that's somebody else. The compassionate person, just as the Hindu sages said, um, says, that's me. That's, that's me. We all share one life. And uh, anything that hurts me uh, hurts them. Anything that hurts them hurts me. And so I must do everything that I can for my brothers and my sisters. It's, a really, it's an absolutely daunting uh, kind of ideal. Um, but you do see, I think, I mean, you know, there are people who give their lives over to the poor. And I used to think those must be the most miserable people in the world. Right, right. But they're laughing all the time. Yeah. They know what they're supposed to do, and they do it. Right. I think... Uh... So yeah, I, think, I mean, how many of us know what we're supposed to do and do it? Right? Yeah, we I know what they're supposed to do. Yeah, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I, I, I don't do it. Um, well, yeah, it's we, hard, though. I it, mean, the little sisters of the poor, right? They don't, they don't get any food that's any good. They don't go on dates. You know, they don't have any fun. They don't get to ride Cadillacs or anything. But when I <laughs> saw them when I was a boy, they were laughing all the time. Right, they right. They what they were supposed to do. So, I mean, like, maybe this can be into this tough question I've been thinking about. Maybe you maybe yeah. don't have the answer to it. But, all right, so Jesus, right? He said uh, his yoke is easy, right? We're just to take upon his yoke and our burdens yeah. will be light. But I'm like, when I think about it, I'm like, man, no, Jesus, like your yoke is kind of hard. Uh, like yeah. loving your neighbor and forgetting about, you know, what I'm supposed to eat and wear the next day, like he told his disciples to do. That's hard. Yeah. Um, so we've got Jesus, you know, ideals are hard to live by. We've got Jesus saying, no, it's really not. So what's going on there? Is it? The ideal is hard, or is it, I'm trying to hold on to the self, the sort of my indiv- my uh, my desires, personal desires. Yeah. Is that what's going on? I think it's like I think it's more like once you've made the breakthrough, you'll be you'll 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 be surprised at how easy it is. You know, once you've decided to live for the poor, once you've decided that you're not going to amass wealth, once you've decided that everybody's your brother or sister, it's it's just not as hard as you think. Uh, it looks impossible, but it's not as hard as you think. Um, I mean, I say this, this is, I'm, um, as, as Schopenhauer said, <laughs> well, this is an extreme example, Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer said, you know, you, you talk about compassion and this and that, but you're really a difficult person. <laughs> uh, I'm not a difficult person, but I'm far from the compassionate ideal. Um, and it strikes me as the very hardest one, but the most available in another regard, you know? Yeah, it is It is the most available. I think you, you, are, you make that case, that point in the book, that anyone can be compassionate. Not everyone can be an Achilles Right, because no. you don't have you have to be born I, probably with some sort of inherent ability to you know have that drive to conquer and be excellent in the, the martial field. Yeah, um, and you want to be fast and strong too. Right, right. You got to be fat, have be physically adept to it as well. And not everyone's going to be you know have be able to do the contemplative life because you know maybe they have something wrong you know their brain yeah. that just doesn't allow them to do that. But everyone can be everyone can be kind. Yeah, everyone can be kind. And, you know, if you take the, the gist of my last chapter about um, Whitman uh, and about Walt Stevens, um, there's the mixture of self and soul, the protection of soul by virtue of some kind of a development of self or defensiveness or position or continuity. And I think that can work. So self self's a devil and wants to take over all the time, you know. Um, Jesus, there was never any danger that Jesus was going to want a trophy for being the most compassionate person in Bethlehem. <laughs> but, you know, some of us would give ourselves to compassion and then start looking for awards two years later because self is still alive and protecting us and keeping us alive and keeping our families going. Uh, but I think that, that 
combinations possible to make. I just wanted to be as clear as possible about what these ideals were, and so it made sense to have recourse to the purest forms of the manifestations. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you could be, if you know, Christ is your ideal, you could, there are ways in which you could become more Jesus-like, uh, ways in which I can become more Socrates-like, you know, for instance, not... You know, when I see something that I think really needs to be commented on, but it's going to get me a lot of shit for doing it, <laughs> I, you know, I, I guess I could step up and do that more often than I do. Right. Um, so you use these characters like Achilles, Jesus, Socrates as forms, kind of, right? They're sort of yeah, that's a good way to put it. I hadn't thought of that. They're, they're absolute forms, right? And, you know, I could have picked out people who were kind of part self, part soul, part this, part that, but the clarity would have been missing. There's, I, I wouldn't say that it's quite a cultural emergency, but... From my point of view, these ideas are sort of gently passing out of our can, and so a dramatic reintroduction of them is a uh, is the best way to go. Okay. Well, so I mean, we've been kind of we've been talking about this throughout the the podcast about the idea of the self. Uh, and I think people, when they hear it, they understand and, and inherently, you know, they understand what it means on the surface. But what does it do? You mean what is a a, a person who is been taken over or captivated by the a culture of selfhood what do they look what do they look like well first of all i think that there there are more and less admirable forms of selfhood right but basically the self is what it says it are it it, it, it radiates around the individual as himself or as her uh self um and uh the ideals on the other hand are aimed at the betterment of all, or that's that's the that's the aspiration, right? Um, self is involved with the betterment of self, right? It, inv- it it's involved in um, uh, getting a wife or a husband, taking care of one's children, taking care of one's family during one's job, uh, paying one's bills, being a citizen, um, getting prestige, getting promoted. Um, and uh, there are more and less decent ways to do that and more and less admirable ways um, to relate to the rest of the world while one is in the process of, uh, of doing that. But the ultimate horizon of the self is the benefit of the a self. Um, right. And the ultimate uh, horizon of the idealist is the fulfillment of something outside the self, the ideal, that has um, positive results, or it should, uh, for other people. So that the, the 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 person in the world of self is not sitting there saying, "I'm doing this for other people," and by other people I mean people outside his family, her family. Uh, he's basically thinking, "These are my desires, and I'm trying to fulfill them." Another way to answer the question is to say that the self is um, lives in a world of desire, right? Um, desire for the good things, desire for success, prosperity, or even just protection and calm and tranquility. Um, whereas the um, the idealist. Um, lives with um, hope, uh, hope to make a contribution to the the larger world, um, and uh, the idealist is also uh, uh, wanting to live at whatever cost with um, meaning, right, ultimate meaning. Um, the um, uh, person in the world of self is looking for, I don't know, significance. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not getting the pairing exactly right, but I think that uh, pairing and, and some kind of orientation to the other is part of what uh, uh, soul, is, uh, soul is all about. Okay. So it's like the 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 self person, the self sort of like Nietzsche's last man. Or you, just... you know, that's that's Nietzsche being nasty. It's one yeah. of my favorite passages. <laughs> I know, I love it too. He blinks. He hops and he blinks yeah. and he watches TV. If Nietzsche had ever seen TV, he would have busted God, I think. <laughs> um, uh, but that's the worst manifestation of self. Okay. okay. I, I think there are higher manifestations of self, right, where people are interested in um, uh, some of the things that you were describing, right. Um, environmental issues, uh, justice, good neighborliness, supporting a church, all those things seem to me in the higher reaches of, uh, of self. Um, and uh, they do leave the region of pure selfishness, uh, but they never arrive at the level of the sacrifice of the self for something that is higher or more, uh, more demanding and ultimately better for other people. Right. Because sometimes, you know, even those good things that are part of the self, uh, they can clash with the ideal that it's, I guess, trying to emulate or trying to achieve. I'm trying to think of like an example. Yeah. I, one, one of the central points of contention there, and I think I could really be richly argued against here, it's something I've turned over in my mind a whole lot, is the contention between compassion and justice. Right. I mean, I think of justice as a virtue of the, uh, 
of the self, and it's an admirable virtue, uh, but ultimately it, um, it, it's based upon uh, dividing up the pie in a way that you find uh, fair, but also congenial, and that satisfies often a sense of guilt. Um, the, um, uh, the compassionate person just, you know, take any pie, take, take the pie, I don't really care. Right? <laughs> So, so it's a sort of a uh, sort of a different uh, sort of a different thing, and then there there are levels of complexity here that involve motivation. I used to think that as an American pragmatist, I used to think what matters most was um, results. Right? What does it happen to? But by reading the Eastern thinkers, I began to get more interested in um, motivation. Um, why do you do a certain thing? Um, and uh, I think. Um, you ask a compassionate person, a truly compassionate person, is compassionate because of love for others, love for the world and love for others. A, um, uh, a just person uh, who lives in the provinces of self may well be being just to satisfy what Freud called his superego, his sense of guilt because he has more than others, um, his sense of anxiety about that. So it's a matter of satisfying a portion of the psyche so as to live more peacefully with the plenty that, uh, that one has. Uh, so motivation comes into it in a uh, in a big way, and you can never tell really what motivates anybody else. And most of us can't tell what the hell is motivating us at any given time. Anyway, uh, we could think about it. right. Um, well, let's talk transition to your argument you make about why the 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 world of ideals began to fade in the West. And <laughs> I'm sure that there's any English teachers listening to this right now. You're not. They're, they're going to be like, wait a minute, with this part. But you argue that uh, Shakespeare uh, sort of kicked things off in a big way in the modern world, uh, in the decline of ideals. Um, yeah, couple of, yeah. So why, what, couple what, did, what did Shakespeare do to be like, yeah, ideals aren't that great? Okay. Um, uh, first of all, um, I mean, the um, general demystification, if that's what it is, or the general denigration of ideals would have happened whether Shakespeare lived or did not. The general demystification or denigration of ideals would have lived whether his contemporary, also a demystifier, uh, Cervantes, ever lived or not, okay? okay. Um, they simply are manifestations of a strong urge uh, that has to do with lots and lots of factors, historical and cultural factors. Um, among them, the rise of uh, capitalism, um, a certain amount of turbulence in the area of uh, religion, the movement to a Protestant or a decentered kind of uh, uh, kind of faith which gives the individual uh, more possibilities for determination and moves them away from uh, transcendental ideals and uh, and uh, uh, authorities. Um, uh, but um, uh, fundamentally, uh, when one reads Shakespeare, and there, there have to be a couple of caveats here, but when one reads uh, Shakespeare, one sees that there's an overall uh, overriding tendency, um, that he's not somebody who is um, a figure of negative capability and uh, the, with the power of being uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts after, without irritable factor, uh, reaching after irritable factor, reason as Keats says, it's a pretty strong polemical purpose. It's just that most of us agree with that strong polemical purpose so that it becomes transparent. Right? Um, Shakespeare's chief skepticism, from my point of view, is about um, uh, martial ideals or about um, uh, the, the, uh, the heroic ideal. So when a heroic figure uh, gets onto the stage in uh, Shakespeare, he's going to be almost inevitably destroyed. Now, that, that could just be a tragedy. But in the process of being destroyed, he's going to be anatomized, and he's going to be humiliated. And in that process, um, uh, not only destroyed, that's tragedy, uh, but discredited. That's polemics. That's cultural polemics. Um, so an example would be Macbeth. Um, <clears throat> what makes Macbeth brave? In the beginning of the, of the play, we see how brave he is. He's done extraordinary martial deeds. Um, but then as the play unfolds, we see that Macbeth has an amazing kind of anxiety and insecurity about masculinity. And when Lady Macbeth wants him to do anything, all she has to do is tell him that uh, he is not truly a man, and if he were truly a man, he would do it. And then he goes on to do these absolutely horrendous kinds of, uh, kinds of deeds. Now, Shakespeare's play isn't suggesting that everybody is a, who is a hero is anxious about his masculinity. Um, if Macbeth clearly cannot uh, uh, produce children the way a previous husband, a paramour of Lady Macbeth, can. Um, but this is a relentless blood blood-making hero <laughs> um, who, uh, who does have enormous insecurities about masculinity. So um, 
compensatory activity becomes a way to explain Macbeth. And so after watching Macbeth, we go off and we uh, start looking at heroic warriors in with a new lens. Uh, and that lens is what, what's being compensated for here? Yeah. You know, what's the, what kind of inadequacy does this individual possess? And as Shakespeare brings one after another of the heroic individuals onto the stage, he gives us another lens by which we can demystify, as it were, if you believe in it, um, their claims to heroism. Um, and I think that's one of his larger polemical uh, uh, purposes. And, you know, does it not make sense that it's time, culturally and historically, and especially economically, to clear the ground of these useless aristocrats and to replace them by a new generation of men and women with new values, that is, the values of the um, uh, up-and-coming bourgeoisie. Now, Shakespeare doesn't seem to be thrilled with those people either. Shakespeare's not thrilled with anybody. Right? <laughs> yeah, the Merchant no. of Venice, right? Like that's kind yes, of, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's, you know... How does the Merchant of Venice end? It, it ends with um, the slightly admirable, but rather dark Shylock, you know, absolutely scapegoated, destroyed, and in the most sadistic way possible. And it also ends with Antonio, um, who has a love for Bassanio that is probably homosexual, um, being mildly scapegoated and marginalized and sent even more deeply into his melancholy. And then the rest of the rich, happy people can party on. Um, you know, is, is this is this paradise after we've gotten rid of people like Othello and Macbeth? I don't think it's quite paradise, <laughs> even from Shakespeare's point of view. Um, so it, it's not a rosy picture overall, uh, but I think there's strong skepticism bordering on contempt for heroic individuals. And in terms of our other great ideals, um, religion just doesn't play much of a role in Shakespeare. I mean, right. Like Santayana says, you could read the whole thing from end to end and not realize that humanity has a religious life of any import at all. Um, and in terms of high thought, Shakespeare is surely not averse to it. And there are moments, well, particularly in Hamlet, where people say things, characters say things, that may have a transcendent, transcendent truth to them. But mostly in Shakespeare, people do what Dr. Johnson says they do. They talk for victory. They talk in order to get what it is they uh, they want, and when they seem to be philosophizing, they're really trying to get an angle on the person they're talking to. Um, so I think Shakespeare hasn't got much use for religion, um, has a little bit of use for high philosophy, but not too much, um, and particularly has no use for the heroic ideal. So what what does Shakespeare Shakespeare believe in? Like nothing, sort of like a is he a nihilist or I mean is worldliness? He, worldliness, a couple of things, being hip. You know, yeah. um, realizing that uh, most people in the world are not disinterested, but uh, function out of desire, uh, are out to get what they want, and often are able to disguise what it is their program is, unless you have read Shakespeare, in which case you will be able to see right through them, because he did too. Um, so if you were sending your son or daughter out into the world to be a lawyer or a business person, no one better to read than uh, than Shakespeare. Um, the other thing that you can associate with Shakespeare with as an ideal, and this is a little bit precarious, um, is that of the writer, or the creative force, the creative individual. Right? Um, his eloquence is so astonishing. His productivity is amazing that he goes on to inspire um, lots and lots of writers and some thinkers too, whose objective, in some measure, is to change the world, right? He inspires the English and American romantics in a major way, right? But I don't really think Shakespeare's objective is to change the world, you know? Yeah. It is to render it in its authentic guise, which is that of contending desires. So be a creature of the self. I don't know if there's any recommendation there. No, it's not easy right says, this is how it is. Okay. Right? Um, and uh, sink or swim. <laughs> this is nothing else, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, after, if, if my and Cervantes' and Montaigne, whom he clearly adored, uh, once our demystifying work is done, what you're left with is the Merchant of Venice and, you know, Bassanio and Portia, a couple of hustlers, uh, though alluring and beautiful, no doubt. Um, it, it, that's not so great, but it's probably better than being lorded over by people like Othello and Macbeth. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, <clears throat> well, let's talk about the, the other big figure who you argue helped the decline of ideals, and this is Freud. Uh, what did Freud do to help diminish ideals in the West? 
Well, um, uh, Freud believes that every single action we perform and every thought that we have is based upon desire and that it is based upon a desire to do something for the self, to gain something, to achieve something, to have something. Uh, and this is manifest in something like Freud's theory of dreams, right? In the theory of dreams, uh, Freud says, a dream is a disguised fulfillment of a repressed wish. But that repressed wish is always a wish for satisfaction of your own, okay? No one has ever dreamed, according to Freud, at night of world peace, okay? And if he did dream of world peace, it was an illusion for dreaming about, you know, uniting with his mother or sister in some unsavory way. So um, there is nothing but the self in, uh, in Freud. What about aspirations to soul? What about aspirations to soul? Oh, Freud hates them all, right? Um, and he hates, uh, he's just overt about it, you know. So <laughs> if you say to Freud, what is heroism? What is heroism? Oh, Freud says that heroism is becoming intoxicated with the approval of the father, right? So that the state becomes the father or the general becomes the father. And seeking the approval of the father, we were going to run out and get ourselves killed. If you want to call that heroism, I wish you the best, right? What is romantic love, which is the next ideal, really, in, in line of the next possible ideal that Freud is particularly fiercely disposed against? Um, romantic love is a lot of nasty things in Freud. It's the overestimation of the erotic object. It's putting the beloved in the place of the ego ideal or, or super ego. It's, it's just it's one mystification after another. Um, the great mystification of religion is the mystification that all people are brothers and sisters. And as soon as you try that out, Freud tells us those people that you thought of as brothers and sisters will disappoint you in some profound way, and they'll probably take your wallet to boot. Um, so any time there is a, uh, an aspiration to transcendence, uh, Freud is against it. Now, why um, do we aspire to transcendence, then, from Freud's point of view? Not because transcendence legitimately exists, but because transcendence or the ideals deliver us temporarily from our pain. Suddenly we have purpose, suddenly we have meaning, and the psyche, which is usually in Freud at war with itself, is united into one piece, one coherent piece, right? And that makes us feel pretty good. In fact, it's very much like getting drunk, right? You have two, three drinks, and suddenly you're not this kind of mass of contending aspirations and desires. Suddenly you're one. So you commit yourself to the heroic ideal, or you fall in love, which is Freud's paradigm for all these things, or you become, you aspire to Jesus like. Um, uh, uh, compassion, or you seek um, uh, true wisdom, which psychoanalysts call epistemophilia. Uh, you unite the psyche temporarily, but then, uh, after a certain amount of time passes, you become disillusioned. You find that the beloved isn't truly worth loving, or as much as you thought. You find that heroism is a suck and a sale, so on down the line, and you become disillusioned. And as Freud says, he, sh he could have quoted Wordsworth, if he knew Wordsworth. Um, as high as we have mounted in delight in our dejection, do we sink as low? Except it's really about ten times as low from Freud's point of view. Once you're disillusioned, you really crash very hard. Um, so the best life is the one that doesn't go in for illusions, but realizes that we're fragmented and contending, self-contending beings, and tries to live with it. Rather noble, I think. Right. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, is that like I mean, is Freud the reason why whenever someone who does aspire to live an ideal, we're like that person's crazy? Right, like yeah. you know, I mean, like he's like he's he's he sold all his stuff, and he's giving yeah, it to the crazy. poor. Man, yeah. he's a crazy yeah, person. I, um, I gave a talk once uh, to a group of psychoanalysts, uh, and they were very bright and very responsive, and uh, it just it was a pleasure to talk to them because they're very candid as well. And one of them said to me, "If somebody came into my office and said, I want to be a compassionate individual, I want to be a hero, I want to be a great thinker, I would say um, you're you know probably suffering from some kind of neurosis, and we should begin treatment fairly soon." Right, right. So yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, because I mean, I, I even I mean, you probably even see this in parents. Uh, you've you've seen this before, like sort of the, it's the uh, stereotypical tale of a young person who who has this ideal they're going to go for it, right? Whether it's going they're going to join the army yeah. and be a Navy SEAL, or they're going to devote their life as a missionary in some foreign field, but their parents are like, no, wait, you know, you should go to college and like. Yeah. You need to get a job and like make a living. Don't don't do that thing. And I guess we have Freud to thank for that. Well, you know, also just you know, bourgeois safety and security. Right. I, I was reading a book by Jonathan Haidt. I think his name is of Happiness Hypothesis, and he said that people now live for happiness, by which he means middle class happiness, 
because happiness is now so much more available than it was in the past. Um, you can expect to live a long time. You can expect to be secure and have a good job and have a good family. Um, he wasn't quite at the point where he wanted to contend with the idea that what is called bourgeois happiness doesn't really make people happy. Right. It surely doesn't make everybody happy, you know? Right. It, it is- this sort of leads to like my next question. So you, you argue in, in the book that you know th- there are glimmers of these ideals, but they're simply simulations of the ideals. Um, yeah, that's the last chapter. And it's one of the reasons that I talk about Freud's uh, sense of the psyche as noble, um, because uh, Freud lives in a world where you repudiate the ideals, and what you're pretty much left with is a rather pained and rather anxious and sometimes depressive psyche. And you have to live with that, but it's worse than the exhilaration of commitment to an ideal and then the dejection that follows upon disillusionment, okay? Um, And in Freud's time, there were ways to compensate the self for its its limitations, okay? You could read a novel in which... uh, which, uh, Freud loved to read novels that were kind of wish fulfillment and escapist. He knew it. He didn't care. Uh, and you could read an escapist novel and you could become the hero, right? And so suddenly you kind of make your way out through a fantasia uh, into, um, uh, into a heroic satisfaction. Um, but still, it was tough. It was definitely tough to live without God, to live without romantic love, um, to live without heroism, all those things. It was very difficult to do those things. Uh, and so there was something admirable and noble about it. But what we've created since, you know, Freud died in 1939 or so, what we've created is a, is a technology of um, mock ideals of mock transcendence. I just, my uh, nephew taught me to play a heroic uh, role-playing uh, game uh, this, uh, this weekend because I thought that I was going to kind of gas on about these things. I should know a little more about them <laughs> than I do. Um, it was sort of great, you know. You you became this creature with all these powers, and you went off banging and shooting and racking up scores. I was actually pretty terrible at it. Um, but you know, multiply this times about a million, and the most really dangerous of all of the um, ideals from the parents' point of view is shown to have uh, these compensatory or uh, simul- simulacrum uh, manifestations in the culture. Uh, and you can find almost anything, any one of the ideals, in simulation form in our contemporary culture. And uh, so there's a technology of mock or false transcendence that far exceeds anything that was around during uh, Freud's time. Now, somebody could easily come along and say, look, we've got this figured out. You live a safe, safe, reasonable, middle-class life, and you do miss certain things, but you compensate for that missing by virtue of playing video games and watching the news a lot to get your wisdom and uh, watching a lot of football to get your uh, courage. And overall, that's the best way to live. Well, that's overall, that's the best way. It's the least dangerous, and you're less likely to do harm to other people. I could understand that argument, it seems to me. Um, But I do want the possibility of something else to be out there for people who are spirited, who don't like it the way it is now in the culture, and who maybe don't quite know why. So so that's what you're the whole thrust of this book is it leads up to this you know the final chapter too about ideals today um and as you're reading this and you read the book I, i'll be honest i sometimes i got a little depressed i was like man like is it is it possible to, to live these ideals because there are instances where i think like yeah i am living this ideal but then i think well is it, maybe this is just a simulation of the ideal yeah. and it's not really it and uh so it, it, that's the question is is it possible to live the, the life of the soul in the 21st century? Or as you said, is there, is it, are you looking for maybe a, a hybrid of self and soul? Yeah, I think it's always possible to take a, a step in the direction of, um, of soul, right? I mean, if you've thought hard about a subject, if you have done the research and the work and talked to people, and you have something to say that's out of keeping with the norm, and you bring it forward and do it modestly and intelligently and with humor... Uh, and it um, achieves some interest and some unpopularity, you've taken a step in the direction of Plato and Socrates. If you show up at the hospital a few times and visit and talk to people and uh, who are in pain, and uh, maybe uh, volunteer for a little while and do your best, you've taken a step in the direction of, uh, of compassion. I, I think those things uh, remain, uh, re- remain available. Um, it's too much to ask somebody who's 35, 30, or 40 years old to drop it all and tell their children goodbye and that I'm going to go become a, a saint in India. Um, uh, I think it's too much to do that. 
But I think that it's quite possible to take steps in this uh, in this direction. Um, and you know, you know, you're there when it both hurts and feels good. You know. Mm. I like that. That's a good. That's a good way to to know you're there. Because you always you often wonder, like, am I doing it? And that's yeah. a great way to put it. It hurts and feels good. I mean, it's not about happiness. So it's my one of my favorite writers, Camille Polly, says happiness is for slugs. <laughs> happiness is for the last man. Yeah, that's that. He's happy. Yeah, he's happy. Absolutely. I mean, have it, as be. Right. Well, Mark, this has been a, just a fascinating discussion, and uh, I hope you know, the people who are out listening to this will go out and get your book because it really has a lot of uh, a lot of great stuff to chew on in your brain. Um, I'm still chewing on stuff that I read a month ago. Um, well, thanks so much for your interest. I really appreciate it. The book's only gotten one really re- real review so far, so maybe we stimulate a couple more. All right. Well, I'll put my review on there as well. Beautiful. Well, thank. Knock it down. Okay, awesome. Well, Mark, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for the great questions. You really thought about it hard, and I'm most, uh, uh, it really was helpful to me. Well, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. My guest today was Mark Edmondson. He's the author of the book Self and Soul. And like I said, it's one of the best books I read in 2015. Go out there and get it. I think you'll, you won't regret it. A lot of things to chew on there. You can find it on Amazon.com.